and how did you come across me? Um, I was, it just, the nutrition's been like a, um, uh, a interest area, I guess. So I guess, yeah, we can start with that. Um, okay, so is it okay if I call you Brooke? Yeah. Okay, Brooke, it's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet I'm you. Nathan. Thanks thank for you. having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, I came across you just cause it's, um, it's a, a passion area of mine a little bit right now, especially. And I, um, I, I don't even know if I can call myself this, but I, I practice like amateur bodybuilding mm-hmm. i guess is like the, mm-hmm. the way i train in the gym yeah and so um it's it, not as much now but for quite a long time i was taking my diet very seriously and i had a coach and we're going over everything and mm-hmm. i just got the more and more i got into it the more and more I, I got obsessed with just everything so you start with like calories and then it's macros and then it's micronutrients and then you're starting to, you get to the point where you're like meal prepping for based on your energy to get into the gym yes. um and then trying to like make sure this you get into the minutia too of like trying to make sure you hit like your your protein goal at the right times of day after the gym and stuff like that and so just yes. looking into that universe and i came, I came across you just googling and so and right. i read your website and then found your bio and i was doing a little bit of prep last night as well mm-hmm. and i thought um <laughs> i was like oh my goodness i could talk to her for hours it seems like you've got a lot of a lot of information in your background there. Yeah, so. I do actually. Yeah, <laughs> I think I do. Um, you know, after 14 years as a dietitian and uh, yeah. yeah, I, I, lots and lots of interest areas really, but yeah, yeah. I'm sure we'll get into it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd like to cover <laughs> as much as we can. Um, and so you are the, the CEO of Food to Fit Nutrition and mm-hmm. you've got a location here in Saskatoon and one in Regina? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Did you start it as well or did you become the CEO after the fact? I took over the business, a, it will be 12 years ago in March. Okay, so cool. it was a very small business, single dietitian. And so I joined that dietitian, but then, you know, that they wanted to cut their ties with mm-hmm. a lot of different things and move on to a new opportunity. So I sort of jumped at this opportunity to take over a private practice, had no idea what I was getting yeah. into, really didn't have a lot of um, mentorship, although I did soon after um, seek out mentorship from different private practice dietitians uh, th- throughout, mm. you know, whether it, it mostly in Calgary, but um, and then very quickly realized that there is a small but very quickly growing community of yeah. private practice dietitians throughout Canada. So I, I had no idea what my niche was, what area I wanted to work in. I wanted to originally work in sport okay. and be a sport dietitian. And I, it just wasn't going to kind of work out the way I wanted it to. So the opportunities I think were limited and, um, yeah, the sport med and science council has a dietitian. And I think that's where a lot of the elite athletes would access. So in terms of private, I didn't really think it was going to be super lucrative and I didn't necessarily want to just be working with folks who were, you know, at the gym mm. and had an interest in changing their body composition. Yeah. I also very quickly realized how disordered that can get <laughs> and how much fixation there can be on the gram amounts and the yeah. macros and uh, a, a lot of specifics, but it, it, it got it it felt very disordered for me and I really struggled with that. So over the years found a niche. Now we have two offices uh, in Saskatoon and one in Regina. So there are eight of us dietitians and a social worker. Okay. Yes. And a student who helps with our social media. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. Why a social worker? That's a great question. Um, for a while I had been you know, just figuring out whether or not we wanted to add a social worker to the team. And I think predominantly it was because we were more and more working with people with varying, uh, I think, on the spectrum of disordered eating to diagnosed eating disorders. Mm. So we we were seeing more and more people with really complex mental health and relate food relationship and eating disorders. So we thought that that would be a good 
addition to the team. And then Monique uh, knocked on my door and said, hey, would you ever consider hiring a social yeah. worker? So it, the stars aligned. I'd been wow. sort of uh, putting that energy out there, I guess, for some time. And then it was a really great fit. Yeah. So she's been with us for over two years. Yeah. That's amazing. That's so interesting when stuff like that happens. And you just have to like sit there and like just accept Manifest it. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Is it two and a half years you said now? Yes. And has it been as beneficial as you, you hoped it would be? Yeah, it's great to have somebody to refer to when we have our own clients or even plant a seed. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're not necessarily referring all our clients to her, but even we do talk a lot about mental health and where our scope of practice would stop is mostly just to inquire about how is your mood and mental health. Number one, to break the stigma and get chatting. Mm. And number two, to plant a seed if we think they could probably use some support from a therapist or counselor. And number three is because a person's mental health can really affect their capacity for putting meals together or for cooking or for prepping or for grocery shopping. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people who struggle with severe anxiety hate the grocery store. So, yeah. you know, there can be so many aspects. Um, people who are neurodiverse experience, you know, varying um have varying relationships to food um for for example what i'm learning is for some of my clients with adhd they really struggle to either um pay attention and and not be too distracted by other things right so they struggle to tune into their hunger cues and mm. eat and okay. remember to eat so many of them are have really chaotic eating patterns yeah. Um, or just putting together what, what one might consider a basic meal can be very overwhelming. It's just what one might think of is three steps. You know, a person with ADHD could think that it's like a hundred steps mm -hmm. and there's too many things to do before you get there. Um, the other thing that I'm noticing too is, uh, medications, you know, can yeah, I was gonna ask about that actually, yeah. a person's appetite. And so then we're almost having to eat based on a clock rather than that internal cue of hunger. Mm -hmm. um, it can be just so far reaching. So yeah. that's, yeah, we, we like to talk about mental health. And then, of course, we know that people are complex. And so sometimes talking about nutrition seems like a very straightforward thing, but it can just be, you know, the most, maybe you start unpacking and peeling back layers and it's like, wow, there's so much going on for you. And what they thought was maybe, for example, I hear all the time, I'm just lazy and I hate that yeah. word. I think it's a really judgmental word that's produced by our society. And it's like, it's not lazy. Let's peel back that back. What is actually going on for you? Mm -hmm. And so then it's like, okay, there's a lot behind the scenes. Maybe working with a counselor can also in the long term support their nutrition or health goals as well. Because yeah. we know health comes in a package. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, like you said, it's yeah. complicated. I would think too that a lot of people that think they're lazy probably just don't know what like they don't know what getting into all of this looks like and then they know that they don't know so it would the dauntingness of it could make them feel like they're lazy i would think sure yeah. totally and, yeah where do i even begin yeah mm -hmm. and so it's just an easy thing to say instead of like no you can you can do it too you're not lazy it's just it's a little bit it's daunting like we said mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah and um on the medication front too i would imagine that one's really like really difficult to overcome for a lot of people just because especially with something like ADHD, like a lot of those stimulants not only are disrupting your neurochemistry a lot of the time and your, and your mood, but your appetite is in, like perpetually suppressed a lot of the time, is it not? For a lot of people. So what I'm learning, um, and again, this is just from practice experience and observation. Mm -hmm. I am not an expert in medications, but what I've come to learn is for majority of people, ADHD medication can suppress the appetite, and especially mm. with kids, um, you know, parents and 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 their doctors are really sometimes concerned about weight loss and and just trying to keep weight on. So we have to, eat, um, you know, support their feeding in a, in the windows that their appetite is stronger. 
Um, and then just trying to get those more highly palatable foods um, that really hit the taste sensors. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it is a challenge. For some people, appetite is not affected. Hmm. And, um, they're, and, and they just um, really benefit from the medication in many different ways. So, um, yeah, the medications can really help as well. Uh, obviously with impulse control I've understood mm. as well and we know that there's actually a high um, correlation or association between ADHD and binge eating disorder for example or okay. other eating disorders mm. so um, if there is you know really uh, impulsive eating and I think what I've come to learn is that some people will stim or stimulate with food so then um, that can sometimes lead them to just be stimming and snacking all day long. So the medication can sometimes help with that. Mm. However, if someone has binge eating disorder and the medication is suppressing their appetite, when that wears off in the evening, guess what? Yeah. You know, they're, they're binging. You kind of like a rebound. Yes. Yeah. So then we're make, having to make sure that even though you're not hungry, we need you to eat through the day and do some mechanical eating or based on the clock mm -hmm. so that they're not f really low. And then once that medication wears off, just famished, yeah. which would trigger a binge as well. So wow. I've never thought about that. Yeah. 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 It's difficult. I would imagine to be like, not only want to fix your nutrition then have all these other problems. And so it's cool. It's probably really rewarding working with everyone and kind of helping them get through these things. Yeah. That's an, how do I feel about the word? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I feel like, Oh, I, I guess it is reward. Of course it's rewarding. We love what we do. Mm. And I suppose, um, what I'm feeling about that word is, is it selfish? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> and so very much the focus is, on the client mm. on on their centeredness and and is directed you know all our care is directed by them so i i know that we throw the word client centered out a lot in our healthcare system i like to use client directed care and so it is very much directed by them they lead the way i am just their guide mm -hmm. to the map you know and i'm there as a support on their journey so um yeah I suppose it could be rewarding, but I don't know if all the clients necessarily, I think they do, but it's really hard work, especially as we are working more for pe with people who are struggling with their food and body relationship. It can be such a difficult journey because of our society's mm -hmm. fixation and obsession on thinness and having the right body and, you know, um, yeah, fitting into a small box that most people don't actually fit into. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could understand. I could understand the the feeling weird about the word. I do think it's important though. Like with a lot of things, anytime that um, I think for a lot of professionals and with a lot of professionals with clients, because if if something is not rewarding, even though it is selfish, like you said, it can. If it's not <laughs> at least rewarding, then it can almost a lot of the times it can swing back to resentment, right? Totally. So, oh yes. Yeah. I so I'm sure it is. Yes, it must be. Re I do love the work that I do. I've just um, never thought of it as like for myself. And yeah. Maybe I'm not sure what that says about me. <laughs> my own. Well, there's nothing wrong with being selfless. So. <laughs> but um, yes, yes, I I love what I do, and mm. you know, even though I run a multi practitioner practice, which keeps me very busy. I do still love the one-to-one -one counseling and mm -hmm. the frontline work, which is why I still do it. So um, certainly I dabble in other things like media, television, radio, writing, magazine interviews. Um, but I, I really, really love the one-to-one -one counseling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you always know that you wanted to do it in that form or I guess, you know, you mentioned wanting to go into sports nutrition a little bit beforehand, but yeah, I think I always, um, yes, I always wanted to work one-to-one -one with folks. And I mean, there's multiple ways in a private practice and many private practice dietitians have multiple income streams. Hmm. They're, um, doing other media, they're doing sponsored content. They're, you know, working with brands, um, and they're writing books and 
they're maybe working in the agriculture industry or other areas. There's so many ways to make money. Some of them have excellent podcasts, but um, yeah, I, and I, I'm not sure, you know what, it's been a journey. And I think I, I'm not sure I had a vision from the get go. I mm-hmm. just jumped in and I figured it out as I went. Maybe isn't always the best way to go about business. Um, but I think at the same time, if I waited until everything was perfectly aligned, I would still be working mm. in the public sector, which I did also love and is absolutely necessary. But I knew my heart was, I, I, I knew my heart was running my own business yeah. and I knew my heart was just working with people in a different way, maybe digging deeper into their lives, spending more time with them. And working with people who weren't acutely ill, um, you know, as a little bit more of a preventative, but also there's tons of gaps in the public health care system. Yeah. So trying to fill those gaps and then also get people connected into the public system where they need and mm. when it's necessary. So I always wanted to maintain um, that integrity. Um, it's not me versus acute care. It is how does private practice you know, compliment and yeah. work with. That's to be a bit of a synergy, right? Yeah. Our public health system, yeah. totally. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting too. And when you know, like mention gaps in the in the public health care system, I think a lot of people are, are noticing that, unfortunately, right now. And um, the, does it come up a lot in conversations, or is it just something you're you're noticing? We do sometimes notice that. Um, because people don't know the healthcare system and they don't always know the questions to ask in order to get um, access to the right, even testing or mm. so. Um, doctor, family doctors are hard to come by as well, and they are overworked. And yeah, for sure. Um, I think they are, from what I've heard from other family physicians, they are seeing more complex patients as well. And then they have limited time with them. So sometimes patients don't know what to ask or they're not sharing maybe the most pointed information to help the doctor really understand. So some of our role is to devise really direct questions that they can take back to their doctor Mm. so that, um, for example... Um, I work a lot with people who have uh, gut health issues, functional gut health issues like irritable bowel syndrome. So it's like, well, don't just tell your doctor you're bloating, you're bloated. Cause like that could be anywhere along the GI tract. Like yeah. where is that bloating? So, you know, helping to devise the specifics and then, you know, it might be helpful based on your symptoms to inquire about a celiac screen or mm. a calprotectin or which are blood markers or, um, you know, if, if we think that there might be something up with their thyroid or their iron levels. And so really just helping the client to, um, create a a bridge and a relationship with their doctor. So here's our assessment. We can send a report to your doctor Mm. and then I encourage you to go have a conversation so that we're kind of bridging that gap and trying to create a team. And that's the thing is private practice is so isolated. Yeah. So we really try to draw in the other healthcare providers. Yeah, I want to stop because can. you can't know everything, and they can't know everything, right? And yeah, and of course, I'm not trying to put anybody down or talk negatively about any totally. profession. But yes. um, do they? Do you find that they kind of push back sometimes on what you're suggesting that people bring bring to them? Their uh, their no. family doctors. No, but I I think again it has. We have to be. Uh, what I, I was having this conversation with another dietitian recently, but I think what's important is that we have to understand the Saskatchewan healthcare system and where we're at. Mm-hmm. So as dietitians, even if there's a client who wants to explore something, sometimes we have to um, kind of talk them down to, well, here's the nature of things. Here's what's available. And um, here's what I know. Here's what I or we generally don't know. There's like so much, and nutrition science, it's a really complicated area yeah. to test because we can't just put people in, you know, an institute uh, and, and, you know, do um, unethical testing on them. Mm. 
even though that is what we technically had done in the residential school system. So totally appreciating that. So dietetics has a long way to unravel from mm. that. However, um, yes, we really rely on um, epidemiological studies, which aren't the greatest. So there's tons that we don't know. And so, sorry, back to the question. Um, I think it's just knowing the nature and what's available and then working within those limitations. Mm -hmm. So we can't be asking for, you know, um, you know, testing that's really out there. Um, and certainly there are practitioners who, who might, you know, engage in that, but we, I don't know. I, that's just my own personal, I don't speak for other dietitians, but yeah. yeah. So, no, of course. Um, but no, I, I personally don't think, I, th I think like any health professional doctors will think critically and they know their patients and they might, you know, deny a certain test. And I'm sure they have their rationale, of course, because we're not having these direct conversations direct, you know, necessarily with them. And that makes sense. Just like we have our rationale and we have our assessment. So all we can do is really, um, write the assessment, give them some input and say, you know, we wonder if it might be worthwhile to look into these tests and then they might say you know go go with that or not i find the better route is rather than me send a, a report to the doctor saying i recommend these tests it's have the conversation with the patient and have them take in their yeah. list of questions and then say you know the dietitian based on her assessment wondered if we should test blah 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 for this reason and i find if the client is having that conversation with their doctor it goes over a little better than yeah. me just telling them because they're like who are you and like what is your assessment so, yeah exactly i've uh, had that experience we, a little bit myself too yeah, yeah yeah it's uh i i don't know i have so much respect and i know that they're the healthcare system right now is very tender mm -hmm. so i'm trying to be really patient and and respectful of all modalities and and we have clients who are just, I mean, we see a lot of people who are just feeling really unheard, feeling lost, feeling gaslighted even, um, and not intentionally. You know, I never think that a provider intends those things or harm, but that's how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. Because we spend so much time with our clients, I think we can be a bit of an advocate for them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, that's one of the, the issues, too, is about what somebody was trying to get across and what actually came across. Like, for example, I work in the financial services industry as an assistant, and um, I read a report a few weeks ago that said that financial services, it was like the, it was the top, it was somewhere in the top three of professions that's distrusted in Canada. And um, I think it's because it gets a really bad rap from stuff that happened in the past and then also bad professionals. Because, um, mm. for example, in, in the practice that I'm in, I've, we've seen people come in that have been sold a product that if you were following the regulatory guidelines, they should not have been sold. And then you find out that it's the type of product that the advisor that sold it to them got a very large commission. And so mm. stuff like that happens. Sure. And then that person gives everybody a bad rap. They just think it's everybody thinks, well, like, no, they're only out to make you get your money and this, that, and they don't want to help. Right. And then there's practices like the one that I'm in. And that's all we're trying to do is help. Um, and I, I think that the same thing happens in uh, healthcare, and I would imagine in, in nutrition as well, mm -hmm. is that people mm -hmm. have this experience with one doctor and they think like, oh, no, they're all like that. They're all dismissive. They're all terrible. And they make these blanket statements. But I, they're all just people, ultimately. Like I had yes. to change family doctors in the last, um, I think like four years now I've been kind of moving through. And I got a new one. Cause mine retired and he did feel that way like dismissive and not listening mm. so i was able to find a new one luckily and he's great he listens Good. and like you talked about being heard yes. um but i think sometimes i do that a lot we forget that this person is also a person you know yeah. they're just they've got their yeah. own ways of doing things and just because you felt this way doesn't mean that all other doctors or other all other re registered dietitians are sure. that way as well they're all just trying yeah. to help yeah. they're doing it their way yeah, yeah. Yeah, you hit on a couple of really important points. I think the first um, that I, one of the things, so we, in our practice at Food to Fit Nutrition, we talk um, as a team about what it looks like to uh, decolonize our practice. So we, we take things like um, social justice and anti-racism really seriously. And, and so in those talks, though, it is um, how can we... Um, how can we 
I think, hear our clients and listen and basically not over over talk over them Mm -hmm. and so and also i think the most important thing is how can we narrow the power gap so for example i am a white cisgender female of middle income like there and i'm you know neurotypical like i have when you look at the power real wheel the only thing that i don't have is being male Mm -hmm. so then it's like okay how can we narrow that gap so one of the things that we've started practicing is you know when we first sit down with our clients to say you know um this is me i'm a registered dietitian blah 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 do our introductions and say i'm here to first listen to your story so i'm gonna hold some space for you tell me a little bit about why you're here and i will believe you like that's Mm -hmm. and and i think some people need to hear that i believe you like thank you for sharing i believe you because i think not everyone feels believed and um, no matter what's going on, it's like, okay, I believe you. Um, and even if it's, if it could be psychosomatic or, you know, um, it's, it's still something that is causing them maybe mm-hmm. distress. So there's that. But um, also, I am first, I, I tell my patient, my clients, I'm first human, I'm second dietitian. So this also alleviates the pressure on me to know everything because yeah. I don't know everything. I don't know how nutrition interventions are going to um, work in your body. We we do have a lot of science and we, we practice from an evidence-based um, uh, you know, standpoint or I guess uh, basis. And then obviously I have some practice-based knowledge with 14 years behind me. But first and foremost, I'm human, which means mm. I might make mistakes, which means I'm also open to being corrected. Yeah. So, um, it, and it doesn't matter what, what it is. Like just if the person is like, you know, I, I need to set a boundary with you. I don't feel comfortable with that question. Um, you know, that feels whatever it may be. Like just, I want them to feel safe and open to share yeah. so that I can learn and, and do better. Yeah, you know, exactly. Well, to and then, reduce harm. Yeah. yeah. And then they feel more involved in what's going on as well. They don't feel like they're only being prescribed something, right? Like you can mm-hmm. actually work with them. Mm-hmm. So That said, I totally recognize the privilege that we have in private practice because again, like every initial consultation is 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. Like it's so, it's twice as long as you would get for most initial consultations yeah. with a dietitian within the system. So I think every practitioner is doing the best they have in the time slot that they have. I think there's a lot of pressures. I think there is, um, yeah, a lot of barriers to providing optimal care and yeah, reducing harm. But mm-hmm. yeah, so then we get blanket statements that may feel dismissive to a client or a patient yeah yeah it's tough it's like anything anything else in the world you can't well, no none of us are perfect and can't do the job perfectly right mm-hmm. so yeah and admitting that <laughs> yeah well, like you said i think it's like you said being human first and then a dietitian second and ex- going over that with clients i would imagine that it's like have you always done it that way told them that no have, oh gosh no <laughs> so i imagine there's probably a pretty there's pretty a, a pretty stark contrast between before having that conversation after, I would imagine. Yes, yeah. I would say even in the last three, four years, um, as a team, we've we've really dug in and had some hard conversations, but really explore trauma, what that means, um, what our clients are coming in with. And, oh, I mean, the reason we are here today is because of all the mistakes I've made. So I've had to really come full circle and make sure I'm practicing self-compassion because I have made so many mistakes and no doubt have caused, you know, um, whatever level of harm to people, um, even, you know, emotional, uh, just by not really knowing, you know, and so... I think it's okay to know that we're human and we make mistakes, but we need to be open to correction and listening and recognizing when we do and then course correcting. Yeah. So, okay, I'm learning and not to just get too hung up in our mistakes. But that is tough because uh, a lot of dietitians, myself including, are pretty 
type A perfectionist. So we, we and we see the harms of perfectionism when mm. it comes to even how our clients eat and trying to be perfect with nutrition. Sometimes that can very quickly turn to disordered eating. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm only here because of all the mistakes I've kind of made along the way and because I continue to be open to learning yeah. and, and know that I don't know it all. Yeah. Well, what are you like at the end of the day? What are you doing if you're not doing that? Right. Because if you're like for anybody, if you're like 5, 10, 15 years down the line and you haven't made any mistakes and you haven't grown or changed at all, like what are you like? Really, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, and mm-hmm. so. And um, this is a bit harsh, but I call I call them fake people. Like I don't like they don't because they don't seem real when you're talking to them. But the type of person that is always um, lying and not being honest or authentic, they always feel like they're trying to get something out of you, like conniving. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they also need to be right. Mm-hmm. And everybody's had that that experience with people, whether it be a friend or professional. And they, they, they feel fake. Like they actually feel like they're not a real person that exists. Mm-hmm. So it's refreshing when you get into a setting, like I imagine your clients get into with, with you and you're sitting down with a professional and you're like, oh my God, this is I think an actual real person that wants to have a conversation with me, wants to help me. They're not just here with this facade in front between us, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, part of that client rapport building is to, laugh with them and to share little tidbits about your life where you're comfortable to you know where like relate with them if if that's Mm -hmm. makes sense or even just like you know thank you for sharing i i've never experienced that myself but i can imagine that was xyz yeah you know um yeah i think it, it just takes a little bit to just listen and tell the client i believe you I believe you when Mm -hmm. you tell me that's hard, you know, instead of like, it's not hard. You're just not trying enough, Um, especially. So, I mean, I hear this a lot. I I think, you know, the big reason a lot of people will see a dietitian is for health, which is a code, pardon me, a code word for weight loss. And um, so... I think the obvious um, or what I've come to learn from people, especially those with higher BMIs or in higher bodies, is this idea that, oh, you just haven't tried hard enough to lose weight or it is incredibly bogus. And if given the choice, most people would not choose to be in a higher weight body. So I think there's a lot of assumptions mm. that people choose to be in a higher weight body. Um, but most people I see have tried multiple times in their li- lives. And sometimes it's a cycle of diet after diet after diet to lose weight. Mm. Um, and we're finding in research that this is actually contributing to chronic disease just that weight cycling and dieting is really hard on a person's health um, mental and physical so anyway that is one example of uh, yeah just believing the the patient and checking in on our biases Mm -hmm. and assumptions that we have especially about weight given our society's obsession with health is a weight health is a size Mm -hmm. yeah is that is that um that is still something that you're looking at with clients right though or is it is weight like ever part of the the conversation great question i just had a student a nutrition student and i love having students because they bring a new perspective and they are so fresh but they're also just very much part of you know society and they're Mm. they're taking in everything so they bring in a a fresh look at what they're hearing and what they're learning so the student said I was pleasantly surprised that because you practice from a weight inclusive or what we call health at every size um, approach that you do still engage conversations around weight loss Hmm. so I said well we can't expect because our society is still very much like the the weight normative approach the approach to care is weight normative like bmi is health weight is health size is health and shrinking your body is always better which is very untrue based on a lot of really good science but that is kind of the bias and the consensus still Mm. 
So I said, well, we can't not talk about weight loss. Um, I mean, when our clients come in desiring it and wanting it because it exists everywhere. So we have to support them through that. So we're very transparent based on what we know from experience and from um, science uh, with our approach to care. You know, we are not going to risk a person's nutritional um, health or encourage restricted eating which is disordered or um, potentially cause harm putting them at risk for an eating disorder we Mm. know that dieting is one of the causes um, or one of the factors that can contribute to eating disorders so um, but we will hear them and hold space for their desires for weight loss we can't not who who wouldn't desire weight loss and even though you know for example I've done a, a lot of work on you know, accepting um, my size and shape changes over the year. Granted, I live within privilege, so that might be a little bit easier for someone like me. But um, still, uh, it's not uncommon for people to have done the work and still have a level of concern about weight gain, you know, Mm -hmm. or, you know, still feel uncomfortable no matter how much, you know, your body liberation you're experiencing. Um, there can still be discomfort with body changes, especially in the upward direction. Right. Yeah. Fatness because of our society's fixation on, on thinness and health. So, Mm -hmm. um, so our approach to care is very much, well, what are the measurable factors? So we look at biochemical data, we look at their food relationship, we look at where they're struggling with meal planning or preparation or eating, we look at uh, mood and mental health, their energy levels, whatever goals they have. And if weight loss is still a goal, we just get more specific. And then again, transparency, we can't guarantee numbers, like nobody technically can, right, they shouldn't course, yeah. be, <laughs> it's a hoax. Um, your weight may change, um, but it's also not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So I've seen time and time again, blood markers improve, for example, for cholesterol or blood pressure with little to no weight changes, um, but with changes to their lifestyle. So diet, sometimes exercise, um, just feelings of self-efficacy, like I can do this. Yeah. And, and just working, giving them supports to work through the barriers they have, whether it's, you know, a full-time working parent with a lot of demands or someone with, you know, a chronic mental health issue or, you know, a chronic disease. Yeah. So mm. what are the things we can control? Arguably, weight is not one of them that is easily controlled long-term. Mm. And a lot of people who diet can see, yes, I have fluctuated. I, I drop and I come up and I drop and I come up. There are the unicorns. So this is about a third or less of the population who will lose weight and keep it off. But based on long-term weight loss studies, it's not the majority. Mm. It really isn't. So yeah that's a really interesting one because i remember hearing i wish i remembered the study i hope it was a study that i saw this in but um it was something like even when you reduce the amount of lipids inside a fat cell the fat cell takes like nine years before the the body metabolizes the cell away so you've just got like a deflated balloon hanging hanging on there Mm -hmm. that is ready to fill itself with fats again yeah so it takes longer to get bigger if you are also making the fat cells but if they're left over from previous weight loss then it's really easy to um to gain it back really quickly yes i remember learning that too in my early nutrition classes and your true? F- your fat cells can um increase in size and number but they never decrease in number okay so once you if you gain weight and then therefore i think the theory is that it is easier to gain weight again mm-hmm. um, because they they exist but i i don't exactly know right no, fair you know, the the rationale or yeah. like the actual um science behind that mm-hmm. yeah. yeah you mentioned uh uh, do you call it healthy at any size <clears throat> or fit at any size? Health at every size. And there's a lot of misconceptions about what this means. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I don't actually use the term very often, but yes, I, I would say that I am health at every size aligned. I think one of the misconceptions is that what we're saying is that anyone can be healthy at any size. That's not what health at every size means at all. 
Health at Every Size recognizes that there can be poor health, especially at the BMI extremes. Mm -hmm. Health at Every Size recognizes that BMI is a very poor marker of health and that people in uh, the quote-unquote normal BMIs can get chronic disease. Mm -hmm. And people in the, say, higher BMIs um, can also be metabolically healthy. Yeah, I think my BMI is like 24, something like that. Like, it's pretty high. Okay. So, and, and, and yes, it's not like, appropriate for pregnant people or for people who are, are bodybuilding and weightlifting, mm -hmm. who retain a lot of muscle. Like, it's just not going to be reflective yeah. at all. So that this is another reason why instead of focusing on weight and BMI, there's so much going on in a person. And again, looking at the whole person and their whole body, you know, in, in terms of um, just what's going on in their life, their emotional and, and mental health, their physical health, so those biochemical markers. Mm -hmm. But even, the, the point is, even if a person's weight is causing poor health, they still deserve dignified health care and they deserve treatment options that aren't just lose weight because mm -hmm. it's obviously not being helpful. So I always say to, to providers, I remind students, providers, um, even my clients, um, a great way to think about it is what is a practitioner recommending to someone in a quote unquote normal BMI or in a smaller body with the same health condition or the same situation as someone in a larger BMI or larger body. So are they recommend they're not recommended weight loss so i would give the i've got a couple of examples just personally um i have heartburn uh it, most of the time it's silent we're still trying to figure it out uh i also have knee issues and i had plantar fasciitis and and blew my <laughs> my i tore my plantar fascia this summer oh, oh it was brutal so um People in higher weight bodies are told to lose weight for every one of those ailments, mm -hmm. right? What was I? What, what options were I given? We tried multiple medications, inhalers. I'm even getting a pH test next week. I'm mm -hmm. getting an NG tube. Um, physiotherapy to help with mobility, movement, stretching, where to strengthen certain muscles. And um, the podiatrist assessed my foot and, you know, mostly I wanted to know if I needed orthotics um, and gave me some stretches and exercises and said, just ease into movement, all of those things. Never once was I told to lose weight, mm -hmm. but, and so that's the difference. And so it's giving people actual treatment options. Weight loss is not a treatment, you know, really. And it's, again, because the quote unquote success rate of long-term weight loss is like, 30 percent what drug would we recommend that has a 30 percent success rate it wouldn't even be on the market mm. so that's one way to, to look at it and so that's what we're there to do is like okay um your desire for weight loss is valid and a lot of people come in and they're like honestly i just feel pressured to lose weight i don't care if i lose weight i just want to feel better it's like great let's focus on that and so whatever it is that we can encourage them to engage in, um, we want them to engage in those healthy behaviors. Mm -hmm. mm. If that is makes it, sense. You know, it makes total sense. Um, do, you think, like, do you think it's ever a treat? Like I guess maybe not necessary is the right word. Um, I know where you're going. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, like uh, when is weight loss um, necessary? You know, and I suppose um, where it becomes, from my perspective, the only time it really becomes necessary is when there's gatekeeping around um, surgery. So even whether it's gender affirming surgery um, or if it's, um, you know, for breast reduction surgery or knee surgery, like we are hearing people um, re needing to lose weight the recommendations from a surgeon's office, um, the requirement to lose a massive amount of weight before they are granted surgery. Right. And so <clears throat> excuse me. often the concern comes down to 
I, I think ultimately it comes down to insurance. So if insurance is going to cover it, it's an insurance requirement right. and they do this to, to weed out certain people and to narrow the, the number of people who can access the surgery. Um, they make claims that it's for all different reasons, you know, safety under anesthetic, the argument that, and there's good scientific study looking at, um, yes, there are risks to higher weight bodies going under anesthesia, but there are also ways to minimize these risks that a a lot of medical students aren't learning because they're not practicing on really high body sizes right and b again just the the bias is and and, and so there are ways to help minimize the risk ultimately though i guess my argument is we don't need to as care providers and again this may be controversial but we don't need to gatekeep we need to include the client in those conversations and say here are the risks maybe there's even percentages maybe there is very high risk I think the client deserves a conversation to decide whether or not they want to take those risks Mm. and so uh, there's again dignity and respect in those conversations but also Hi, fatter bodies are always going to exist so <laughs> medicine needs to do a better job of learning on these fatter bodies mm. ultimately yes that makes sense um is it is it the, the, so the, the a lot of these surgeries are the reason they want them to lose weight is just is just gatekeeping it's just the insurance requirements or well like i said um uh sometimes the claim is safety under anesthesia right okay uh, yeah. and again the risks there yeah, um yeah. i i have seen for example i did a real deep dive into the studies and scientific uh, basis for a bmi cutoff for breast reduction surgery because i had a handful of clients denied the surgery because mm. their bmi is too high but they also are just tired of dieting they've done that um, and I will get back to the original question. Sorry, uh, we're getting there. But uh, so ultimately, even with some of the sometimes the claims are um, recovery and reinfection rates, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a big connection between BMI and infection rates mm. um, post recovery. And again, like, you know, most patients are given antibiotics, you know, to help with that. So right. anyway, um, what this, oh, where, so what was the original question? Um, I was just, um, back to... I think you did answer it. I was just, um, yeah, I was just, just, I was just re-asking if it was, um, the gate, if it was just gatekeeping was why they were telling people to lose weight before surgeries. A lot of, um, body liberationists would say that yes that's what it is and there's a lot Sorry, of what's science. a body liberationist oh great question um a lot of the science refutes that too but so uh body liberation or fat fat liberation is really just um being free of uh the just accepting your body for what it is but also um so when we talk about like body image being a spectrum mm-hmm. where body hatred is on one side and maybe we get to uh, respect, maybe we get to acceptance, maybe we even get to neutral. Body liberation is on the far other end where mm-hmm. you just en- embrace. You might even love the body you're in, although that's not necessarily the goal, but you free yourself from all of the social injustice related to, and you kind of, and so I don't think that's the goal for for most people. And sometimes that's not attainable Mm -hmm. for very, a lot of reasons, but. Sorry, just for my clarification, you don't think it's most people's goal or, or you don't think that it should be most people's? Both. Okay. Um, I don't think it's an appropriate goal for everybody. I don't think it's just a realistic goal for everybody. Mm-hmm. Sometimes there can be, um, especially for people who um, maybe, for example, don't identify as the um, gender that they're born into. So, for example, you know, finding body liberation when you don't align with the body that you have. For gender yeah, I reasons, imagine that's pretty hard. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, but um, I'm not explaining it very well. But no, um, I got it now. Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> no, that was good. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I know that there is um, a lot and, you know, working in fertility, there have been recommendations for weight loss before, you know, people in, uh, are granted, say, uh, IVF um, or mm. in vitro fertilization. And, you know, it's like, okay, well, let's meet with the client and let's see what's going on. So assessing their diet, looking at the behaviors. So um, making sure that they're um, eating frequently enough, making sure that they're, you know, if they are struggling with disordered eating or binge eating, um, supporting them through that, getting the nutrients they need, maybe adjusting their dietary intake Mm -hmm. to add more fiber and protein and reduce saturated fat, things like that. Maybe there will be modest weight losses, maybe there won't, but ultimately it's like, okay, we're checking a lot of boxes here. Can you please consider this patient anyway? Because um, the likelihood of them, you know, losing significant amount of weight seems minimal given their history, they've tried, and it's just like, can you please just talk about the risks with them? Yeah. And then let them decide if they want to engage in that. So we, you know, I did uh, work with one client who was um, successful and in having those conversations and um, was granted the IVF and yeah. So I, I think it's just about um, not just jumping to weight loss conclusions because we know that the science is super weak and that people deserve a little bit more, I believe you, I trust you, um, and a more dignity when it comes to treatment options, which are often, you know, therapies, medication, and so on and so forth. Right. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. I know I don't want to jump topics. I know I said I wouldn't do this. We but, can jump but, topics. Um, we only it's um it's quarter after, so I gotta get get you out of here okay. pretty soon because you have to, places to be. But um, I did want to ask about um because you you brought it up about um working with people on for fertility and on your um biography on your website you mentioned uh some of your practice areas or or client support areas are like PCOS fertility, gut disorders, intuitive eating, disordered eating. The two I was most curious about were PCOS Mm -hmm. and intuitive eating so I guess Mm. quickly with a PCOS what does it what does it look like going into that conversation and trying to organize nutrition around treating and helping out with Mm -hmm. that so polycystic ovary syndrome is a a condition of androgen excess typically Mm -hmm. but um, not always I mean so it's diagnosed based on two of three criteria so um, the first would be um, uh, irregular or or no periods so Mm -hmm. the menstrual cycle can be longer than 35 days or fewer than you know 22 days Um, but very irregular cycle um uh, signs of excess androgens so that can be physical signs like hirsutism which is that face and body hair that coarse right, okay. face and body hair growth um, sometimes a male male pattern hair baldness sometimes um, uh, signs could also include acne um, cystic acne or in the blood work we can test for testosterone markers androgen markers um, And then the third would be an ultrasound showing uh, at least one enlarged ovary um, or multiple cysts on at least one ovary. Mm -hmm. So uh, which now we're also seeing if there's no ultrasound, we can also use anti-malarian hormone, uh, which is uh, just part of the most recent um, guidelines. So um, working with uh, clients, it's a really understanding their diagnosis. and and what their markers are b going through what their goals are not everyone with pcos has the goal of pregnancy and it's not um uh it's not a condition of infertility pcos can affect um, metabolic health Um, it can increase the risk of having high triglycerides and lipids like cholesterol and um, it can increase the risk of type 2 diabetes it can increase the risk of uh, fatty liver you know non-alcoholic fatty liver so it's super complicated and then people have you know sometimes drastic weight gains uh, in a really short amount of time plus all these other symptoms extreme fatigue which coincides often with insulin resistance but um it's a really complicated 
conditions. Just sounds like it, yeah. Yeah, endocrine and metabolic conditions. So there's a lot to kind of break down. From there, it would be, um, I like to talk about the supplements that can be really helpful, whether it's looking at, um, and again, it would just depend on what we're trying to achieve, but um, things like myo-inositol, magnesium, uh, maybe vitamin D, omega-3, like those are the four most common that I might be utilizing to help with insulin sensitivity, inflammation, and of course just meeting their needs Mm -hmm. as well as cycle regulation. Uh, And then adding key things to the diet. The first I ask is, are you eating enough? Because you can't have a regular cycle if you're constantly undernourished so and then secondly it's adding in fiber protein and looking at their patterns so getting people to eat more regularly every kind of three to four hours for that blood sugar stability and adding in key foods that are going to help with insulin sensitization sensitization and androgen lowering so um I, I'm careful not to use the term hormone balance. I know that is a super trendy term, but scientifically, it's. I, I always picture this like fine tuning, um, like when you're when you're, say a uh, a sound person and you've yeah. got a soundboard and you're like you know balancing all these buttons. That is not what's happening in the body. Um, there are ways to improve some of the hormone markers. Um, through through diet, exercise, and supplementation. However, it's not like a fine tuning and hormone balance. Like that's just not a thing. Yeah, the idea that well, especially because that it, when I hear that, that kind of sounds like it implies that there's a static mode for your hormones, totally. which is not true at all. Right. Right. So right. even testosterone in the male body is um, is a, has a rhythm. Changing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, so we know that, you know, FS, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone can often be very off. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we know that without ovulation, the progesterone doesn't come up. Like there's all kinds of things. So we're we're just sort of working with the best evidence around PCOS, which there is actually a lot when it comes to nutrition science. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, I think it just gives people an extra set of hope. Ultimately, you know, when you're going through fertility treatments, um, the medications are excellent. They're very powerful. The specialists are super knowledgeable and they're wonderful. And I, you know, I'm not sure how they feel about the nutrition aspect, but I think when clients are in those spaces, they are wanting to check all the boxes. We don't know what gets them pregnant in the end, um, but I just feel if they feel supported with mental health, nutritional well-being, they're being seen and supported at the fertility clinic, and they just have multiple supports, they're just generally going to do better. Yeah, yeah, overall. Really, just like statistically, if you want to look at it from just a math perspective, if you're in something from more angles, and you've got depending on obviously some things take away from other things, but you've got more of a chance of trying to Mm -hmm. hit the nail on the head there. Totally. Yeah. 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 So it's very careful not to uh, suggest that um, nutrition should replace medication. I am very pro medication and we know that um, there are some excellent ones when it comes to PCOS management. Um, Not everyone wants to go that route, but some people are really glad to hear it. So Ultimately, I just want people to know that they have a lot of options. And then again, bringing in the doctor or gynecologist or fertility specialist to um, further support them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't think we have enough time to fully get into intuitive eating, but I guess if you wanted to define it for me. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting and maybe I should change that on my bio. So like intuitive eating um, is uh, a sort of a paradigm termed by a couple of dietitian Elise Resch and Evelyn Triboli down in the United States. And so it's based on 10 principles, um, ultimately kind of looking at uh, tuning into your body, your hunger and fullness cues, um, you know, using um, movement as a form of self-care, looking at um, food satisfaction and ways to help improve that food relationship overall. Gentle nutrition is the last principle because ultimately we're trying to weed through that dieting mentality. Mm. What I find is I intuitive eating can very much then be used as another diet. 
I do align with a lot of the principles, but they don't, even though they don't always fit with all of our clients. So I'm very, I use, I use it very loosely Mm -hmm. and I use it based on maybe I might allude to a principle or two if it seems to align with where a client is at. Um, But I think like anything, uh, when there's a paradigm and there's a set of principles, it can be used very rigidly. So we have to be cautious with that. And we use a lot of different um, techniques, motivational with our clients. So motivational interviewing, you know, some cognitive behavioral therapy and, and just just listening again just that humanness human connection so yeah um uh yeah so moving a little bit away from just intuitive eating and i'm not a certified to intuitive eating specialist but some of the principles um a lot of my clients can really align with so i'll just sort of cherry pick (laughs) and use what we need yeah yeah great well i guess where can um people find you or any social media or the website or your Mm -hmm. food to fit Yeah, I mean, foodtofit.ca is our website. Um, You can find us on Instagram at foodtofit underscore nutrition and me personally at brookbullard um, on TikTok and Instagram. But yeah, and I I don't post a lot either. I try to get on there, engage, but um, very much my personal um, social media, there will be a lot around weight inclusiveness and social justice and um, anti-racism as um, the basis of a person's well-being. We know that all of these things affect um, a person's overall health. So I do share, you know, recipes that I'm putting together because I still have a love for food. And Mm. obviously I'm human. I got to eat too. Um, But I try not to, I try to remove some of that dieting messaging in, in the things that I share. Cool. Yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to share really quickly or did we... Anything I missed? Oh, man, we covered a lot of topics. And you're right. Like this could be, you know, part A of like, uh, you know, a five part series. But nutrition is a huge topic. And, you know, I I do also, you know, enjoy talking sport nutrition with some of my clients. That is like where Mm. my heart started. Um, and still even relaxing the numbers, but still supporting them with say muscle building goals. Um, I'm an active person myself. So I, I love the sport nutrition. I love the science. Um, the exercise physiology is fascinating to Mm -hmm. me, but that would be a whole other, you know, podcast, but yeah. 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 Well, maybe we'll do another one. one, one (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Yeah. You're welcome.